one of the myths in entrepreneurship is that entrepreneurs don't plan. Well, it's just not true. Typically, they are really into the detail in a highly focused way and really around how to shape what they believe is an opportunity. So this discussion follows up our mapping of the territory discussion about what an opportunity is in the 3Ms and about the Timmins model and how we create a balanced, holistic, leadership-based approach to the entrepreneurial process. Once we believe there may be an opportunity, then we have to dig into the detail to make sure. So let's first look at the industry. In the nature of opportunity recognition and shaping is an understanding of who the target customer is. And we've got to be careful to also understand if there is an end user that's different than the target that we are going to sell to. So is there a value chain that we can clearly understand and lead to the end user. Now this will tell us a lot of things. One important factor is where are the margins in that value chain and are there enough margins or is there excess margin uh, that we can either lengthen or shorten the value chain. It will also tell us who the players, who the potential stakeholders are in the value chain that might have a vested interest in our success. It will also tell us who the competitors are that will go after us. Never underestimate the vindictiveness of a competitor. Now clearly in that value chain, in that industry analysis, is going to be a series of suppliers. Again, understanding how they define value will have a tremendous impact on the way you approach your opportunity. I'm all often uh, amused by entrepreneurs who say they have no competitors or that there are no substitutes for their products. There are almost always competitors and almost always substitutes. Even if the substitute is not to purchase in that area and to put the money in the bank. Interestingly also there are often ignored exit barriers either for competitors who could chip away at you or hurt you while they're trying to get out or for yourself. Can you get in and you have a living dead company that never really provides a kind of return but is too expensive to really exit? At the same time, there can be real boundary shifts, especially if there's a technological interface that changes the nature of the value chain or introduces new partners into this value chain or even creates a more three-dimensional value cluster. The last two are interesting because one is usually governmentally driven, the regulators, and what is in place and what might be put in place and what are the social forces doing that, and then a deep look at who the social critics could be. An example of social critics could be environmentalists around automotive services. Now let's create a base scenario. In the execution, in the implementation of this burgeoning idea or opportunity, what are the key issues and threats and other opportunities that will impact what we're doing. And in all of that, looking at trends is a key vision into the future. It will tell us if it is becoming more tilled in richer soil or is it drying up and flattening out. And then there are almost always nuggets of wisdom that you will know or that you'll find from a brain trust or industry experts that you'll want to feed into that and compiling that, creating an archive and a database of those compelling facts can be a rich source for good decision making. Now you've created a, a base scenario. You've looked at the opportunity, you looked at the idea. You've decided 
yeah, I think that's an opportunity. Then you've created the base scenario, and you've laid out what the terrain looks like. Now you have to go into an analysis that starts with defining the business. What business are we in, and where do we think it's going? Overlay that in the current environment. Understanding where you think the trends are going to come, but now you've put together the data that you can insert your business into the value cluster and into the current economic mix and try to understand, try to impose some view, some pro forma, both financial and non-financial, of how that's going to impact the value chain and therefore your reward. Looking at the financial track record of competitors and how you will affect that and how your financials will emerge is a shaping impact, will have a shaping impact on your margin analysis and on your final assessment of whether this is an opportunity or not. And then what is your strategy both to gain traction in the value chain, to get your customers and to begin a revenue stream and to start to prove your business model and then to grow it along uh, a clear path. So your idea you believe is an opportunity and you've reviewed the three M's and you believe that there is market demand, market size, you understand market structure at least in a gross way and you've done some margin analysis you've dug deeper into the industry and you have a picture of what the value chain or value cluster looks like you've now created a base scenario that says I should insert myself into the value chain now let's take a deeper dive into the competitive reaction of our entry into the market the industry maturity the strengths of the competitor and the comparison of your competitive advantages versus those of the competitor are clear indicators of how soon, how quickly you can gain traction, get initial revenue flow, prove the business model, and begin to move up a growth curve. You've come pretty far along the pathway to new venture creation. I think it's time to pause and do a sanity check. Bring the team together. Do a reassessment about the nature of the opportunity and make sure that everybody's on the same page about what the, the opportunity is and the pathway to growth and value creation. I also think it's important to talk about personal imperatives, both financial and non-financial. What are your short-term and long-term objectives and motivations in this deal? A lot of great teams fall apart because they don't understand the direction the team and the opportunity is going. Now remember, you have a pretty good understanding of what the value cluster looks like. And in that value cluster, there will be a series of relationships that you should begin to develop and understand, both in their definition of what value is and how you are going to either create or impede value for them and what are the boundaries and imperatives that will drive that relationship oftentimes they're contractual all the time there is a relational impact because we are in a value chain or a marketing channel or a supply channel there is a marketing relationship in many of the relationships there'll be supply involved and there'll be growth imperatives and growth initiatives that you will impact understanding that and put it in the context of your industry knowledge is going to make for better decision making in the chaos of the startup and growth period not to be ignored in that are the possibilities that each of those relationships could be impacted by other parts of their company or other divisions within the company we can talk about that more later but understand the depth and nature of 
what those relationships could be. I believe in creating mission statements. You, you've got to know where you're going or it's very difficult to get there. And making money is not enough. We'll talk about that more. But mission statements can be so future oriented as to be impractical for the organization and a small organization really all needs to pull in the same direction. So if you can define what the strategic imperatives are and what how they will impact your opportunity, then bleed off near-term goals from the mission statement. Where are we going to be in 10 years? And that could be 5 or 7 or 8. You need to define that. But bring it back down to this year. A mission statement that helps you do both long-term visioning and shorter-term action is a good mission statement. Let's take a look at some of the ways that mission statements are drawn. And I tend to see them along this spectrum of vision to analysis. Those who are at the extremes drive down in pods of inspiration and oftentimes methods of intervention around the analytical. And you can see some of the impact that will have on the psyche and action of the organization. Lay this out clearly and then move to integrate the view of the future from both the visionary perspective and the hard and practical analytical perspective. If you can develop a mission statement that is both values and functionally driven, not just one or the other, you avoid some of those potholes that have really hindered especially startups but even larger companies and really gives you a strategically driven realistic set of goals and objectives. A mistake a number of startups make is to not clearly define their strategic thrust to gain traction and then growth in the marketplace. I would propose there are two basic variations on the theme with many iterations around that. The first one is to foray and, and test. A quick entry into the market with a business model in a clearly defined smaller attack area. You want to prove the business model and test market acceptance and if that test goes well, then to grow it. Second one is rapid market penetration. Rapid, decisive around the larger universe, either a region or a nation or a globe. Significant time and capital issues and risk issues should be driven, the, this decision should be driven by the market imperatives. Are there competitive forces that are um, demanding that I get market share quickly to block competitive action? Or is there huge capital requirements that I need to first prove out before I can acquire? Let's look at a few strategic options to gain initial traction in your entry strategy for new venture. Most new companies focus on a niche. They find something they do particularly well and they laser beam their energies in gaining a market for their new product or service. More common than you might think is to buy market share by acquiring a company you believe can be shaped to become the kind of new venture you envision. A third less wise, widely used option is to buy that company and then sell off the pieces that don't make sense in your approach to the new venture. It can give you interesting financial options and a base of customers or other strategic assets to gain more rapid traction in the marketplace. 
Last, and it can be combined with these other three strategies, is to go in with a focus and a clear niche and then expand your offering, in essence diversifying the income stream uh, driven by your uh, initial product. Okay, you've chosen your entry strategy, you've mapped it out, you understand what the landscape looks like, you really uh, honed your business model and definition, it's time for another sanity check. Relook at your assumptions and make sure you agree. Reassess the risks and the ongoing risks and the trending of risks. Make clear the resources you're going to need along the milestones to entry and growth in this market. Other requirements. Your textured understanding and the capturing of those chunks of knowledge that's going to give you competitive advantage need to be articulated and shared and making sure we understand who has what responsibility to achieve our goals. Included in that, in or, both individual and organizational forms, are what is the information we're really going to need to gain, capture, keep, and analyze to be successful. That will help you understand what the organizational needs are. All of this gives you a better base for what the capitalization is going to be and what the timing will be to achieve value creation. Now, all that planning has to be delivered in action. Remember the definition or our definition of entrepreneurship is a way of thinking and acting in an opportunity obsessed manner. That means you really have to focus on the detail. I always think that it's best to invite debate and discussion of the merits of all those options, not only from teammates and not only from trusted other key management, but a broader array of brain trusts, even key members along the value cluster who will, as they buy in, give you resources and intellectual support to be successful. There has never been a business plan that was implemented exactly as written. Critical risks and assumptions are exactly that because you have to look into the future and you can't know that it will turn out the way you think. Therefore, what happens if your assumption is incorrect? Should have a planned reaction. A fascinating exercise to not only do as you're writing your business plan, but also as you're implementing and as a sanity check along the way. It provides great fodder for discussion in a well-developed entrepreneurial team. This due diligence will provide you with what I believe is a living business plan. And it will help you allocate resources that are clearly defined by driving the opportunity. That gives you not only a vision and a map of the future, but an operational plan to create that future. Understand that implementation of a business plan is an ongoing process that requires you to always remember the Timmins model and the balance of opportunity team and resources. By that constant re-examination and discussion and communication with key management is what creates the buy-in. But not only for key management, but for other stakeholders who may buy in or opt out. That kind of assessment and re-examination is tooling up for perpetual re-examination and iteration and what some people I think have termed as a virtuous cycle of improvement. And as a final reminder, you need to be a leader, you need to be dynamic. Deal with changes that are strategic in nature and understand the impact on the direction of your venture and don't be afraid to make adjustments. 
it's always a balancing act and keeping the Timmins model in, in mind is important and understand that all your decisions are going to affect all